I want to talk about uh, biodiversity and the uh, sixth extinction. And there's a lot of controversy over that. There are a few uh, people in the world that uh, don't think we're under an extinction event. And I want to tell you otherwise, but I want to give you a more holistic view of this event. Now, I just want to give you a few reminders of what biodiversity is. So we look at it as species diversity, we look at it as genetic diversity uh, of all those species, and we look at it as ecological diversity. And right now, there's maybe 1.4, 1.7 million species discovered and described, but we scientists debate how many are actually on Earth. Um, uh, a lot of uh, entomologists, there's a kind of a median idea that there's maybe 10 million. Uh, many of us who think a lot of biodiversity is very narrowly distributed and that many of these uh, invertebrate groups are much more speciose, uh, some of us think that maybe even as much as 20 million. In any case, biodiversity is really, really important for us. If you like breathing clean air, drinking clean water, having your ecosystems filter out the water, uh, if you're interested in having carbon in the atmosphere uh, sequestered in forests, then ecological services are really, really important. And then just thinking about all we eat, our homes, food and fiber, very, very important. But also I think really important is the idea that biodiversity, ecosystems, natural wildlands uh, promote the spirit and human intellect and have always done, done that. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the transformation of the biosphere. All these kind of cute, uh, cuddly wuddlies are all extinct or are almost extinct. And the debate is whether we're in the middle of a sixth extinction. And that's a very complicated topic that I don't, don't have time to go into, but I think that probably thousands of species have already gone extinct. And the reason why I kind of think that is that we sort of know that as the Polynesians spread across the Pacific, they pretty much drove, ate everything on all those specific islands. And there's a fossil record, for birds in any way, of lots of species that are no longer there and haven't been there for a very, very long time. But then wild lands are being converted at a tremendous uh, uh, rate, and we'll talk about, about that. And we'll talk about biodiversity is massively disappearing on the face of the earth. And it's populations and species. Those are the, the currency that we, we will be talking about. So let's look at some of this evidence. Extinction is about the last individual organism of a species dying. So when a population is extirpated, that's the last individual of that population. When the last population and the last individual of the last population is gone, then that's extinction. So mechanistically, it's all about fragmentation. Now, fragmentation is important because as populations get more and more constrained, smaller, then the probabilities of them going extinct uh, uh, stochastically, by, by chance, go way, way up. And we know that's a very important thing. These are four examples of major uh, mechanisms of fragmentation in the world. So, Rio and urbanization has fractured the rainforest all around Rio. Roads are really, really important. Within the next 20 years, they are going to build more roads that can go around the globe six times. Six times. Right now, there's over 190,000 kilometers of undocumented roads in Amazonia. So roads are everywhere. Everybody builds roads. And it's one of the major uh, uh, components of driving fragmentation. Deforestation drives it. So does agriculture has driven it. 
So fragmentation is a really important uh, mechanism by which we lose individual organisms. They're fractured into small populations and then they go extinct. And this curve is the vertebrates that are being lost globally. Now this is a really interesting study because it's based on real world data on the ground, 14,000 populations monitored, 3,700 species of vertebrates around the world. These are long-term ecological uh, studies. And this study started here in 1970, so we set that at one. And right now, across all those populations, on average, there's been a 58% decline in the number of individuals in those populations. That's massive. That's massive. And these are vertebrates. So, primates in peril. I'll give you this picture. Populations declining. 60% of the 504 species in the world of primates uh, are threatened, which means that their populations are declining. In Madagascar, it's as much as 87%. Asia, 73. America is 36. Africa, 37. So these close relatives of us are disappearing in many, many places. Now, if you think this is depressing, right, then you will be even more depressed after I tell you about this next slide. These are insects, and I know most of you don't like insects. You know, you just don't like them. But this is a very recent study showing that in 63 protected areas, protected areas in Germany, there's been this 75% decline in 27 years, only 27 years, of, of biomass of flying insects. Now, insects are really important because they pollinate everything. Agriculture would not be really easily uh, possible without insects. In the United States, the ecosystem services from insects is $57 billion alone. Insects are the food chain. So insects go, birds go. This, I, I was astonished when this study just came out. It was astonishing. But this shows you that it's things other than these, like, you know, the cute little critters and stuff that are disappearing. Every, uh, everything is disappearing, really. Now, this is a model, and this model is based on the land use and predicted future land use, expected effects due to climate change. And what it's showing is that in 70 uh, years, uh, much of the globe will be lose more than 30% of its species. So they're model trying to model what will go extinct in about 70 years. And that's thir they're saying 30%. And if it's dark red, that's more than 30% uh, of the species go. And then on all the way down. And up north, there's going to be a gain because climate is moving. And I'll show you what's going to happen to the United States by the end of this century. And it's not pretty. And it shows this kind of a thing, everything moving north. So. Clearly, we've got a major problem in River City, folks. Now, I want to talk about three primary causes. Uh, the first one is going to be population. The second one is going to be consumption. And the third is going to be climate change. And how all three of those fit into the loss of biodiversity in ecosystem services. The first one, of course, is population. We know we have around 7.5 billion people on Earth right now. It's projected that by 2050, we're going to be probably in the neighborhood of 9.5. And, and by the end of the century, well, the expectations curve out. And under a, a median expectation, well, we might have in the neighborhood of uh, you know, 11, 12 billion people, up to maybe 16 billion right, by, by then, depending on the assumptions that go into all these models. There are always going to be assumptions. Now, the second is unbridled consumption by I need, I want, I need, I need, I need, I want. 
And by I say I, I mean me, you, we, business entities, political entities, nation states, whatever. Everybody wants and needs something. And there are lots and lots of people out there trying to convince us to want more. From all levels of government all the way else, because now growth is the global philosophy. Growth will get us out of our problems. It will solve all the problems if we just grow, grow, grow. But all this want, all this need has to come from someplace, and that is from Mother Earth itself and from biodiversity on Earth. And it increases our ecological footprint, and I'm going to talk about that in a little while. But, but this is it, man. This is the only place we have to get stuff. And we are getting stuff at a rapid rate and have been doing this for quite a long time. Now, we've converted almost 40% or more of the land of the world to agriculture, and we have to feed people. And so we've increased it. And we're doing all kinds of really cool things to increase productivity for food, to feed the uh, hungry parts of the world and to keep feeding us. And we you know, throw fertilizers and we uh, irrigate more and more crops. We've cut virtually all the original forests out of where people mostly live. You can see in green, that's still original forest, and in red is all the forest that's been cut. And it's, it's an awful lot of forest. We've made major impacts on uh, the marine realm. So this heat map with things that are red and uh, orange and yellow, that shows heavy, heavy uh, exploitation and the less exploitation is in uh, blue. But we've clear-cut, basically, mostly the fisheries. Now, we've, we've leveled off in, in, in actual fisheries because now aquaculture, with its own problems, is taking over. But so many people in the world depend on marine organisms for protein. Huge, huge numbers um, uh, of people. But we're overfishing and pollution is major, especially around the coastlines. Now, we create so much crap that we just throw it away. And so you can see that over here, Canada, US, Switzerland, Denmark, Ireland, we, per capita, per capita and kilograms, for instance, in the United States, every person in the United States gets rid of around 750 kilograms a year. And then it goes down into lower, uh, upper middle country, uh, income countries, down to low countries. But the thing here is everything's growing. More and more and more waste is, is uh, going. Because when you think about it, we're organisms. We take food and matter in, and we shove out waste and dissipate energy. And so we have billions of organisms, human organisms, doing this. And we consume a lot and we get rid of a lot. Now, our ecological footprint of humans is totally out of control. And what do we mean by this? Well, it's an interesting metric that has been around for, for a number of years and it's, it's heavily studied by a lot of people. It's the human demand on the planet's ability to provide renewable resources and ecological services. That is per every, every year. And it, it, it takes into account biologically productive land and water required to sustain us relative to the global area that is available. So it, we measure this in, in global hectares. There's hectares, which everybody uses, uh, a lot of people use in the world for uh, a measure of area, but global hectares is special for this problem. It's just how many global hectares do we all need to sustain ourselves around the world? So here is the 2008 
uh, footprint from 1961 to 2008. Now, I want to call attention to that one there and that line that goes across and that star there, 1970. That line that goes across is one earth. One earth. In 1970, we no longer were sustainable on one earth. And as of 2008, it's one and a half earths. Now it's around about 1.7 earths. So it takes 1.7 earths to provide us with a sustainable, which means that we have an overshoot of about three quarters of an earth. Three quarters of an earth. So this trend is continuing. This is a good metric for telling us that we're eating ourselves out of house and home. My third thing I want to talk about is climate change. This was just uh, published uh, not so long ago, a year ago. But what it's doing is it's showing you the decadal mean surface temperature of the earth. And so you look up in the left-hand corners, 1961, 1970, 7180, 8190, 91, 2000, 2001, 2010, and the last five years. Doesn't take anybody with one eye and half a brain to know what's happening to the globe, right? It's just getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Now, this is going to cause serious problems. It is already causing serious problems. And I will mention that there are hundreds and hundreds of papers showing how global change, climate change, is affecting populations of organisms uh, all over the globe, especially in high altitudes and so on. But now this is the serious stuff. These are the damages that are, this is a re very, very recent study in Science Magazine about what are the damages across the U.S. counties, it's down to the county level, of between 2080 and 2099. So they had all this information of what happens uh, over the years to people and to uh, economies and so forth, and then they modeled it up to where the expectation is going to be of where we're going to be as business as usual. In other words, if we just keep doing what we're doing. So agricultural shifts, all are, as you might expect, are all mostly going to go north and some in the west. So everything green in this instance means negative damage and economic gains. So agriculture will shift. And most of the rest of the country is not going to be too terribly great for agriculture, or it's going to be in that light area, neutral. Then we look at mortality shifts. So you can see where that dark, dark red, that's where mortality is going to go up. And it's based on empirical data of what happens here in the, in the states right now over years when mortality goes up. Energy use is going to shift. The southern part of the United States needs more electricity for more air conditioning. And the costs, these are the costs in GDP for each county. Now, does it strike you that global climate change is going to hit the red states more than it's going to hit the blue states? Now, why do we have this disconnect in this country? If, even if this thing is 30% wrong, that means that your kids and their kids are going to have a very, very different uh, world. Now, the political system, economic system that the globe has, has yielded extreme wealth and lots of stuff for all of us. But Half of the world, about 3.7 billion, live on less than $3 a day. Now, many of those live okay, but they don't have access to all kinds of stuff that the rest of the world have. 
So we have one half of the people in this world like that, okay? Now, the rest of us, and those people too, we've had a totally free lunch. Now, I'd like to ask a simple question. Is there anybody, you raise your hand if there is, is there anybody in this audience who knows for sure that everything they're wearing was harvested in this country, manufactured in this country, and was bought? Is there anybody that knows for sure that that's the case? One. One. So all the belt buckles, shoe leather, everything you have was there. But there's one. But th th this is a big audience. So this is the global. And what we call externalities economically is that we have a free lunch in that we don't share in the costs, the environmental costs in countries or in, even in our own country for extracting all those goods out and then turning them into products and then moving them around the globe. So there's, there's local environmental costs and there's local social uh, costs for people that are exposed to mines and pollution and stuff like that, that we cause by buying it. Now we, again, is everybody uh, that, that, that gets all this, this stuff. So externalities are become really important for trying to think about solutions. And uh, these are services that we don't pay for in general, even in this country. Now, I got to end. They don't want me to keep going on and on. So I want to say that there are many, 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 millions of people in this world trying to do good with the environment. There really are. And, and the more I've traveled over the, the years and gone to biodiversity convention meetings and stuff like that, you just see the troops. So that's a hope. And there are many corporations, local government bodies that are striving to be sustainable, striving to deal with climate change. And, but as individuals, uh, and I'll speak for myself, I don't think we give enough thinking, a deep thinking about our own individual footprints. And that is especially important in the, in the wealthy uh, areas of the world. Now, one thing that would help would be to decrease uh, material throughput into this gigantic consumption system. And if we externalize those costs of consumption, so if you build a big mine uh, pit in the middle of Papua New Guinea, one of the richest biodiversity hotspots in the world, and, well, you'll pay the local people a little bit, but none of that cost is, is, is sent downstream to, to us. And I've flown over there and just seen the rivers coming out of these uh, hills just yellow with uh, chemicals in them. That's a major, major health cost, environmental cost that we don't share in. So externalizing, thinking about how to do that is important. But as a whole bunch of people, and I've really delved into a lot of this in recent uh, months, ultimately major transformative changes in the global economy are necessary to reduce humanity's environmental footprint to sustainable levels. We need, as some of these economists say, we need to find a prosperous way down. And we better do it because the only biodiverse planet in the universe is right here. And the question is, are we going to blow it or not? Thanks very much. <laughs>